So we are going to carve this tomato into a rose. You take the tip of the tomato, not the core, not, not where it's connected to the stem, and just cut straight across. That's going to be the pedestal. The rose is going to sit on that. All right. So then make your turn. Okay, now keep it thin. If the skin is too thick, the tomato skin or rose will not roll up properly. You should almost see the silver part of the knife through the skin. Not too thin, because it will be delicate, it could tear. Anyway, once you get comfortable, get the full, take the full length of the skin off, all the way to get to the core end. So this is near done, because I'm at the bottom. I'm going to take the skin that I just carved off the tomato, and I'm going to lay the outside of the skin down on the board, and I'm going to roll it starting from the end that I finished at. What we want to do is start from the end where I finished, and that's going to be the center of the rose, the tomato rose, the, the, the bud. So let's get that nice and tight. And once you get it started, just kind of pivot it off this thumb. Just kind of roll it. You, know, you can pull it taut every now and then. It starts to feel a little loose under your thumb. Fold that pedestal underneath. Tighten it up. There we go. Kind of wind it up. And that is tomato rose. And our next food art garnish. We'll take this red onion and carve it into a mum, a flower. Now for the onion mum, what we're going to do is we're going to first carve a crown. We're going to separate this into two halves by a crown. So very important, and with a little bit of pressure, but don't stab yourself. Go all the way to the center. Okay, and then this way it'll come apart. I just want to make sure I get it so I don't have to go in there again, which I might have to do. Oh. All right, we're going to need that piece. So let me go in and get the rest of it. Let's see where I didn't get. Okay. Not bad. All right, so now we have both halves of the onion. Not quite half, but that's right. This will be a smaller flower, and this will be a larger one. And I will show you how you separate the layers. Okay, so now let's separate the layers. Now this one's already got a split in it, so that separates easily. This one comes apart. What we're going to do is we're going to rebuild it. See, I'll start it right now. That's rebuilding it. All right. There we go. See how that gets built? There we go. And you can even just keep the center. So that just widens it. So you've got two different styles of mum because you had two different halves. They're grouped together on a buffet. They look really nice. And lastly, we will make scallion brushes out of the ends of these scallions. Cut off the end. Cut it about here. Go down about an inch from the base. And make your cuts. Try to keep them parallel. The vegetable or the scallion will force the knife to the side. And so not every cut's going to be clean. And when that sits in water for just a couple of hours, what's going to happen is that it's going to spread out. So the scallion brushes, after being in the water for even just an hour, perhaps two, will curl up and look just like this. So that concludes Food Art Garnishing Made Easy. I'm Chef Jeff Trombetta from Norwalk Community College, Norwalk, Connecticut. And remember, it's just good cooking. Hello everyone, and here we are at chapter 22. This is Chef Hawks, and today we are talking all about plating and garnishing foods. So, just to get ourselves started up, uh, we're actually going to watch a video from the National Restaurant Association that talks about some of the basics we should be paying attention to whatever we're plating up. Considerations when plating. Presentation is important to the success of the dish. 
It is what tempts our eyes and makes us want to taste the food. This is what makes plating important. Because we first eat with our eyes, the presentation makes a huge impression before we even take a bite. Plating and presentation begin with design, which is the overall plan for how something will look. There are several things to consider when creating the design for a dish. First is the arrangement. Look at the plate or bowl as a picture frame and your dish as the art. Select the right plate or bowl for the portion size that will be served. When plating, make sure to arrange the dish so that no food ends up on the rim. The second thing to consider is maintaining a good balance of color. But remember that three colors are usually enough. The third consideration is height, which is something that can make any plate more attractive. Attractively prop or layer items on the plate, or use a mold to give items a more distinct shape. The last consideration is shape. Keep the arrangement of the ingredients simple. Always cut items in a neat and uniform fashion. Remember, food presentation is an art, and good plate presentation results from careful attention to colors, shapes, textures, and arrangement of food on the plate. Considerations when plating. So let's jump right into all of this. So, how and why? Let's take a look at garnishing and what it's all about. So, we have different types of garnishes. We have edible portions of the dish, which are functional garnishes. Um, this is where you can uh, see Right on the plate up here, you can actually see these specific pieces of garnishes uh, that are around on the plate. They're all edible. And then you have non-functional garnishes. These are items which you don't actually eat, but it, it enhances either the aroma or the flavors of that dish. This may be the a piece of lamb that you, that you see right over here. We've got our um, lamb cutlets right here, and that may, may have some sprigs of tarragon or rosemary with it. And during the cooking process, it gave a wonderful aroma and flavor to the uh, to the lamb. But it's not going to be something that's going to be edible at the end of the day because it gets kind of woody and fibrous and tough. But it looks very pretty. So a garnish should accentuate the main flavor of that dish. Um, we should be removing it before we're eating. Um, if, if it's something like uh, like those pieces of tarragon or anything like that, it should complement the main uh, dish color, the flavor and the texture. It shouldn't be something that clashes against it. This is something we're going to talk about uh, more about during uh, during this session. It should have visual appeal because we eat with our eyes and it should enhance the food and it should be mixed with other components so that everything comes together um, and generally these garnishes are added at the end of the cooking process. So let's look at designing. So if we look over on the right hand side over here, we've got two of the same things. We have two ham sandwiches. So if we're looking at the ham sandwich on the top right here, you can see it has a very different kind of design to the ham sandwich right underneath. And it literally comes down to the way it's constructed and garnished and finished. And so as we're looking at the arrangement, the plate or the bowl, um, it, that is our picture frame. That is what's, uh, what we're working on, our canvas. So we should select the right dish for the portion. Again, if we look at the top sandwich up here, this plate is far too small for this sandwich. It's, it's literally going over onto the edge right here. Food should never be touching in our rim of our plate. The colors should have good balance. We generally aim for about three colors per, per dish so that we don't have clashing colors and uh, and something that's a little on the messy side so we maintain around about three colors is generally the preference the height is really important if you look at these two sandwiches the the one up on top has no life to it but the one underneath here there's so much height to it it bounces it pops as you're actually looking at it uh, if you're making something like an entree, then you'll be propping the protein or um, on top of the starch or the vegetables uh, to give it some elevation, to give it some height. 
And you're always looking to have different shapes in your foods as well. Cutting ingredients neatly and uniformly. That's why we always go with our standard uh, knife cuts. Uh, things like julienne and brunoise. We're doing these as standardized cuts so that everything looks very uniform. Um, and then we can, uh, we can take those ingredients and arrange them in nice, simple kinds of ways. We shouldn't be overworking things uh, to make them too complicated. So the texture is really important in foods. And there's a lot of people who have aversions to some textures. So we should be very aware of the type of textures we're creating in our food. Uh, this is the way that it feels or that it's, it has visible surfaces that have uh, characteristics like crispy, creamy, rough or smooth. So when we're actually making our plate presentation, this can play into what can give uh, visually pleasing stimuli to your eyes as you're looking at the plate. Um, if you look over on the right here, you see the crumble that's on the top of this. Um, it gives this wonderful crunch kind of a look to it. And that's what we'll, we'll be expecting when we go to eat it. Now, if that doesn't come true, if that's actually soggy because it's been sitting in a refrigerator overnight, um, then it would be a disappointment to us. So we have to live up to the presentation we give. But so really important and something we should never forget is the, uh, the, the direction of how we experience foods. So we're, first of all, we're looking at it with our eyes. So we eat our food with our eyes first. Then we smell it. And then after that, we taste it. So in going in that order, that's where we should make sure that our food visually um, and then uh, to your nose and then to your mouth, to your palate is pleasing all along the way. So we have two different areas um, of plate presentation techniques that we're going to look at. So the food itself and then the actual plates, the platters, the dishes as a whole that we're going to use. Um, as our canvas to create our masterpiece. We should always keep our presentations simple. Um, using the sauce in moderation, uh, this is something that at times can be overdone where we can create um, a plate that ends up uh, kind of swimming around with way too much sauce in there. Um, we should use it for visual appeal and to enhance the flavor. It shouldn't be like a soup that overtakes that dish. Uh, the food arrangement, generally, we either aim for the center of the plate or over to one side of the plate. Um, so, and generally speaking, we're going to be looking to do things either in threes or in odd numbers. Uh, odd numbers are a lot more pleasing visually uh, when you're looking at a plate. Okay, so let's talk a little about bulk garnishes. These are things that we can actually create in advance as you can see in the in the photograph over here and um, we've got some sliced tomatoes that have been pre-prepped and some pre-washed and and, uh, and prepped up pieces of lettuce as well so this is all set up so that we can do larger amounts of things relatively quickly we can make lots of different plates look the same and look make them look very attractive with minimal timing um, when we're doing this so this can be to do with things like lettuce, tomatoes, and onions. It might be finely minced herbs that you can sprinkle across the top. It might be microgreens. Uh, and microgreens, if you don't know, are basically small uh, herbs and small lettuces which have only been grown to a very small sprouting uh, uh, life, span, uh, life cycle. Um, and so you'll have things like micro basil where you're actually picking that and the, the leaves are literally uh, about a third of the size or less. Um, of regular basil and so that that gives you the flavors um, but you you have it on a much smaller scale that can be sprinkled across the top uh, you can have glazed nuts grated cheeses and grated vegetables sauteed vegetables and the sauce of course as well if you have a bright vibrant sauce that you can use uh, to garnish up your plate it's always about the kiss method keep it simple Okay, let's have a look at these two plates that we have here. So, color plays a massive role in what we do. So we should have a variety of colors. It should have visual appeal. There should be a balance though. Generally, we're aiming for about three colors on the plate so we don't have any clashing. And we're using fresh ingredients because fresh ingredients give us those bright, vibrant colors. Uh, and then we're looking at shapes. A variety of different shapes um, can be visually stimulating. And those shapes should complement each other. Make sure that they don't clash, then they don't look kind of strange and they don't sit nicely on the plate with one another. 
Uh, there should be a balance of food shapes um, and the and the plate as well. The plate should be able to match with the food you have on it so that it's not sticking out over the edges or anything like that. And so just taking a look at these two photographs, um, you see this. Uh, we have a, a beef dish here uh, with a, uh, the sauce. This uh, may be like a horseradish cream sauce and some broccoli. Perfectly adequate to eat. But there's no visual stimulation right here. It's a very busy rim to the plate uh, for, a, for a dish where it's brown, green, and white. Um, and so there's nothing that's bright and vibrant that really pops. Whereas you look down here at this filet of trout that we have here, and we have a pepper sauce and a basil sauce, and then we've got a piece of leek right over here, the tomatoes, a couple of herbs, and the perfectly seared off filet right down here. The colors in here work well with one another and also the design of that plate because that's exactly what this is. This is a design of a plate has been put together with mastery. So textures, very important to us. So there should be a variety of textures uh, that can add appeal. Let's take a look at what we have over on the two photographs on the right hand side. So we have a plate here that has no garnish to it. Uh, with cheesecake and we have a plate here with cheesecake that has uh, a fantastic garnish to it but so now on both of them with textures you'll see on the bottom and the sides of this cheesecake we have this this crumb crust that we start off with so that gives a differentiation of texture between the crust and the actual cheesecake itself people love this it, it really makes that food pop it also gives definition around this particular cheesecake uh, to give a little more eye appeal to it as well. So you want to have those physical textures, the chewy, the crunchy, the coarse, um, and, and, the, and the soft, just so that everything um, has differentiation between it. It's not like when we were a baby and we were just eating pureed food. We want to have those differentiations in our food. We want to have visual textures in there. Well, we can see in the pureed, speckled, flat, smooth. We want to be able to see these things so that it's visually pleasing to us as well. But a balance in these textures. We don't want to have everything on that plate be hard and crunchy. We don't want to have everything on that plate being pureed. So we want to be able to have a balance of them so that they work well together. We also want to, uh, we want to look at seasonality as well. If you take a look at the garnish down in the bottom here, it's a nice simple chocolate and caramel sauce which has then been flaked in between just to give the nice design and the strawberry so in the middle of summer it's perfectly fine and when in fact from the late spring through summer it's perfectly fine to have these strawberries because uh, they're in season right now and they're delicious however if it's december and these strawberries are not in season uh, in the area where we live then why have something on the plate that won't have that perfect taste to it that's probably going to be highly acidic and it's not going to have the sweetness and the fullness of flavor that you get when strawberries are in season and picked when they're ripe. So we want to make sure that anything that's on that plate is reflective of our time of year. And we can also do things which are reflective of holidays as well. So what do we put all of our food on to? That's part of our presentation as well. So whether it's a plate, a bowl or a platter, we need to use the appropriate size. Remember that sandwich we looked at that was sticking out over the edges? We shouldn't have that kind of thing happening. Um, we should have an appropriate size um, piece of plateware to be able to use. The colors should complement with the food we're using. This is why most of the time most chefs will go for a white plate um, just because it's a blank canvas. It gives them something pure to be able to work with from the beginning. If you do have colors on your plates, then you have to then aim for the foods to be able to work well with those colors and not to clash. And that can be very difficult at times, and it can be restrictive at times on the foods that you want to present. So when you're designing, uh, you want to have the appropriate time and temperature constraints um, that, that are notified for what you're creating. Um, if you're in a restaurant and you know that you're serving a, a large number of uh, desserts which are going to go onto this floral uh, type of a bowl and you only have 20 of those bowls and you know you're going to have 75 people come into your restaurant tonight if you're planning to be able to have those dishes be eaten from and then washed and uh, and brought back to the dessert station and chilled down in time to be able to put that next dessert onto it may not give enough time 
And if you're serving hot food, you want it to be on a hot plate. If you're serving cold food, you're serving it on a cold plate. Um, and otherwise, it can mess up the food that you're presenting as well. Um, so we have to be able to make sure that we that we have appropriate things for what we're going to need. Um, so we have to be able to make sure we've got the appropriate um, and available equipment, the staff, and the facility to be able to cope with exactly what we're designing. Um, it should be easy to eat. We shouldn't have dishes and plates that make food harder to consume. And that's why it's important to be able to have something that's large enough to be able to, um, to be able to slice into, say, that piece of meat into that ribeye. Um, if you have a plate that's literally the same size as that ribeye and you're cutting into it and there's ribeye juice spilling off the edge, then you're going to be very uncomfortable in that restaurant. We should be making our customers feel very comfortable with exactly where they are. But your dish is your canvas and your rim is your, fra is your frame. And so we're never placing food out onto that frame. That's so that it can be taken over to the table nice and cleanly and presented. Um, and so that the, uh, the customer, the, the client, will be able to enjoy that meal. So let's look at some principles of arrangements of foods onto our plates. So like I said, we're keeping the food off the rim of that plate. We're arranging the food in unity. And that, so that's to, that's to mean that we're not placing separately placed foods um, on different areas of the plate. We're not in a cafeteria um, where, you know, where you're separating out the vegetables from the meat, from the potatoes. We're, we're using them all in unity together to create a presentation. We want to have attractive placement of those food items. Um, placing the best side of the meat forward. So where you can see on here... Um, this actually has excellent grill marks that we've actually achieved on here. Well, if they didn't turn out so well on the other side, then let's place the best looking side straight up. Um, so we should always be placing things like the back of the duck or the chicken um, should go away from the guest. They should either go underneath or away from the guest's view so that they see the pristine piece of meat and the outside of the meat there. Um, and then uh, in the same way with this, Whereas the uh, bone-in ribeye, so the bone should be facing away from the guest. Just as, you, as if you were the guest looking at this plate right now, the bone faces away from the guest, so that that way um, they get to have the meat presented to them. So when we're looking at uh, different uh, sources on our plates, so the sauce should be an improvement to the plate presentation. As you can see on the, on the picture right over here, it's nicely swirled through here. It's part of the design. It's not just dribbled all over everything. It's not just dumped uh, so that we have uh, the, the brownie swimming around on that plate. It's placed on there just enough for what's needed uh, to garnish this plate. So we shouldn't be disguising or masking foods with our sauces either. Uh, so just a thin ribbon of color. Um, it, we can serve additional sauce on the side if need be. Uh, say if you had something that they wanted to dip into a chocolate sauce, you can have that in a ramekin on the side. We should never be over sourcing anything. Keep it light and natural. There's no need to put red coloring into this, uh, in, into this sauce here when we have incredible strawberries, raspberries, things like that that we can create these amazing colors naturally with. And so do not, uh, don't use the same pattern over and over again. If, if customers go into a restaurant and they order four different entrees, those entrees shouldn't all look the same just with a different protein on them. They should all look different. They should all be their own concepts. But there should be some balance um, to keep those dishes functional as well. There should be a balance of color and of design so that it looks as one piece. But again, the KISS method, keep it simple. Adding height to our dishes is critical. It adds beauty to everything that we do. So using uh, seasoned crackers or natural bones um, it, it are all part of it as well. As you can see with this bone-in pork chop right here, having this bone here adds to the height. It adds to the beauty of that plate. Uh, relishes or marinades, uh, marinated vegetables uh, can create ramps. So as we can see, this pork chop here, we've got the rice right here that's created a ramp to actually hold this pork chop up in the air. Um, which we can use uh, vegetable cuts or seasoned croutons in our salads. They can add different, uh, different heights to it as well as crunch to it. Uh, we can mold or shape starches and vegetables. So as you can see on here, this is a timbal 
of rice that we have right here. That's the shape um, that this is called. Um, we've got Dauphinoise potatoes. Uh, these are layered potatoes uh, that have been baked with a cream mixture in here. And then we can slice them or we can cut them out with uh, different, different shaped cutters. We have Duchesse potatoes, which is a form of mashed potatoes, puree potatoes, that you can then pipe out into different shapes. In, in, our, in our class, actually, we've piped out some amazing little nest shapes and things like that with our Duchesse potatoes. You can use piped pureed vegetables, or you can use shredded potatoes as well, or you can use bundles of vegetables. You should always be using natural the natural shapes of the bones that are in whichever kind of cut of meat that you use as well. And then you have different cuts of vegetables that we've learned about, including tournée vegetables, which this is an image right here of tournée vegetables or turned vegetables, as you turn the knife across them to make these football shapes. And so you actually want to build a composite plate. And by what we mean by that is that the plate isn't made up of separate articles. We don't have a meat in one corner, a vegetable in another, and a starch in another with a sauce in the middle. Everything is composed together like a fantastic piece of music that all comes together and combines to create a masterpiece. Fried parsley. This is one of our traditional garnishes, and we're going to look at a few more traditional garnishes too. This is very simple, but it brings out an amazing color and crunch to that parsley. Uh, so you get the flavors from it, you get a crunch factor from it, and you get incredible bright vibrant green color from it as well. So it's very simple. We're actually just going to pick the leaves off the parsley stems because the stems are kind of coarse and fibrous. And then we're going to wash them and dry them. And then after that we deep fry them, literally just for a few seconds um, at 375 Fahrenheit until they're crisp but maintaining that green color. And that's why it has to be done quickly um, but just for a short period of time. And then we would place them onto uh, a single-use paper towel uh, to be able to drain off the excess oil, and then we serve them immediately, because they can start to break down fairly quickly after that. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the process of frying uh, the parsley chips. Uh, we're partway through it right here. We're gonna join in to this video. So another garnish we have is fried leeks. So we literally just clean the leeks off. They do tend to get some uh, dirt inside the uh, inside the leaves there, inside the layers. Uh, and then we're julienning them, which is the matchstick cut. Um, we're dusting them with cornstarch and then deep frying those literally just for a few seconds just to crisp them up. Um, and then you can see, and then we drain them off as well. Um, but as you can see right down here on this uh, soup right here, we just can drop a few of those matchsticks on top for a beautiful garnish, adds crunch, adds flavor, um, and adds a wonderful aroma to that uh, to that soup. Mushroom caps. Some mushrooms in themselves are beautiful. Uh, so we can literally just snap the stems off, as we can see over in the photograph on the right here. Um, you can uh, scoop out any of the remaining stem that's in there if it doesn't cleanly snap out. Uh, and then we can just simmer them two to three minutes in salted water, uh, the little butter and lemon juice. Uh, you can uh, saute them off as well if you want a slightly richer color to them as well. But these are a very traditional and gorgeous garnish to be able to have on the side of especially roast meats, things like that. Frosted grapes. These are really simple. Literally all, you're, all you need to do is uh, clean the grapes um, and then you're just kind of brushing them over with a little water and then sprinkling them over with granulated sugar. It just adds this wonderful frosting appearance to them um, that can make them really kind of a neat garnish for things. And then uh, we're looking at uh, platters. So simple and practical arrangements of vegetables can be placed around. As you can see um, on this platter right here, we've got our Sunday roast right here, a nice piece of roast beef. And then we've got some vegetables and roast potatoes just gathered around the outside of them. The platter doesn't have to be super elaborate. Uh, it can just be nice to have, the, have them pleasantly arranged on there with simplicity. Any extra sauce, as you can see, I have a gravy boat right here. It's perfect. 
We can have additional sauce available or additional gravy available, but it's over on the side, not interfering with the appearance of our overall dish. Always remember, serving hot food on hot platters, cold food on cold platters. This is key and critical all of the time when we're serving food. So speaking of making sure that we have hot, attractive food, um, which is done on time, one big thing that we need to be able to do um, in the industry is to be able to serve large banquets. So how do we serve a large banquet with attractive food that's hot and that's served on time um, that all comes together when it's needed for, for a banquet? Well, we're going to join into this, um, into this banquet line right here, and we're actually going to see how they take everything and move everything along. And so as you can see on the left hand side of the screen at the beginning of this production system here, they have piping bags which are filled with, um, with mashed potatoes. Um, and so they're actually piping them out into a spiral type of a shape onto the plate. This gives a ramp to be able to then place some of the other garnished items. So we have green beans, and we have uh, we have carrot stems right over here, and so these are then lent up on the ramp right here. And then it goes through to some uh, pieces of grilled tomatoes, and then over onto the onto the beef right at the end here, before they're then covered over with these plate lids, these plush plate lids, which will actually hold in the heat. So from start to finish, if you actually time out from when they first pipe on the first mashed potatoes until that plate cover goes on, and they're then moved over into this uh, hot box right over here to maintain their heat. It's about 23 seconds per plate from start to finish. By doing this, they're able to serve over 100 people in less than 10 minutes, and they're able to do it with, with dexterity and beauty on every single one of those plates. And no matter whether you're at the beginning of that pl plating process, or if you get the last plate that comes off that cooking line, Every single plate looks identical, and that's important to exactly what we're looking to achieve. So continuing on with different types of garnishes, so uh, for things like salads, we have cucumbers. So we want to select a blemish-free cucumber, and we're going to go and wash it, obviously, because that's what we do with all of our salad items first. And then we're going to score it with a channel knife, or you can just use a peeler. Um, as you can see over on the, 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 uh, slide, the side cut right here of this, you can see where it's had the skin removed from those edges, either with a channel knife or with a peeler. It just gives a different a different color variation to it. And then you're going to score it. No, sorry, then you're going to actually cut both ends with a chef's knife. And we're going to slice um, an eighth of an inch thick to a quarter of an inch thick slices, not cutting all the way through the cucumber and just leaving about a quarter of an inch of the flesh still connected just at the back of this piece of cucumber. Because then you can fan these out, and these can be placed on each plate or the gorgeous fan for every single plate that you're designing. So then we look at designing uh, different garnishes for desserts. So this could include things like fruit coulis. We looked at fruit coulis in the last chapter. We made a uh, raspberry and strawberry fruit coulis in the last chapter. It gives very bright, vibrant colors, flavors, and a different texture to that dessert. We have whipped cream that can either be spooned out or can be piped out. Uh, frosted mint leaves in the same way that we were looking at frosting the, uh, the grapes a couple of moments ago. And then we have different chocolate work that we can do as well. We looked at some of that in our last chapter as well, where you can actually pipe out um, some chocolate that's been tempered to create different designs and shapes. Um, and you can use different kinds of sweet sauces and sponge sugar work as well. As you can see right here, um, we can create these wonderful nest kind of appearances, or we can make these domes, um, among various other different things as well. So how do we make sponge sugar? Well, let's take a quick look. It's really a very simple thing. Now, I would, uh, I would let you know as well, though, the sugar is exceptionally hot, and it will burn if it touches your skin and can stick to your skin. So if you attempt any of these things, be extremely careful. In this quickie session, I want to show you how to make the spun sugar. Some of you have requested. Now, first thing to make spun sugar is to learn how to make the caramel. So here, sugar, and there are two methods we make the caramel. One is the dry method. 
in dry method we do not add any water at all but the wet method we add little water this is little easier for the people who are doing for the first time see the mixing has to stop once the sugar melts you can see that the sugar is all melted and this is when you remove your spoon or fork whatever you're trying to mix it with and you wait till the sugar slowly changes its color if you mix it it form crystals even if it forms crystals do not be worried put it on the stove again and heat it without mixing slowly everything will melt back the sugar goes through various phases first it becomes like a sugar syrup that is good enough for gulab jamuns then it becomes slightly thickened and becomes like a nice sticking gel like thing which can be used in lot of toffees but today we are going to learn how to make caramel is slightly turning slightly golden in color by the time it reaches 163 degree centigrade it will start caramelizing and you will get a nice golden color make sure you have a towel handy and also the pot in which you are making this uh, caramel also should have a nice long handle like this so it's easy to handle now you can see that the sugar is getting slowly caramel color wow now switch off the flame now can you see this nice yellow color now this is become a nice uh, caramel very light caramel this is good to use for spun sugar once it cools down it will start becoming threads this is really hot and also you can see while this is falling down if the thread forms they will fly away look at the thread i don't know if you can see it wow i'm just waiting for this to slightly cool down once this forms little bit uh, threads that's when i'm going to spun the sugar even if a drop of this sugar falls on you you will hate sugar so much that you will never eat any sweets again so be very careful now you can see that the threads are falling this is the time when you can spin the sugar just keep spinning like this you know using the fork you're just throwing the sugar out now with the help of your hand just lift this uh, spun sugar you can use it for decoration on many of your sweet preparations so as you can see really simple but it has a wonderful uh, wonderful appearance to it again just be very careful anytime you work with sugar and uh, the temperatures are extremely high so let's look at some application techniques that we can use. So there is a string, what we call string work. This is where we're doing very fine piping um, of different things. It could be creams, could be uh, uh, could be uh, different sauces, or it can be uh, some pastry creams, things like that. Uh, we use our artistic design, multi-layering our desserts up, uh, one you know, some within others uh, to give more depth. Piping cream out. Um, and then we also have the placement of multiple dessert items on the plate where you may have several small dessert items that all go together on that single plate. So what kind of different things can we use to, uh, to uh, garnish for our desserts? So we've got herbs, so things like mint and tarragon work really well uh, with our desserts. Uh, thin slices of fruit, citrus curls, uh, using the, uh, the citrus rind um, without the pith. Um, so that we can uh, uh, we can sugar those up, um, and we can have segments of those. Uh, chocolate shapes and curls and shavings, like I have down in the uh, bottom picture right here, uh, where we talked um, on the last chapter about taking that tempered chocolate and making designs uh, that these will actually hold together, even though they're very delicate, they'll hold together because that chocolate is tempered, so it has that tensile strength to it. Um, using different kinds of glazes, uh, roasted fruits. Uh, bold meringue peaks um, and in fact I also placed on here these are meringues uh, which have been gently baked off so they don't have any color so they're crisp almost like a meringue cookie and then we have uh, caramel decorations that we can use as well so for soups we have three different categories of how we garnish our soups so we have the garnish which is in the soup itself we have garnishes that are used for the toppings of soups, these will be for thick soups that can hold a uh, hold a topping garnish on top, and then garnishes 
which are an accompaniment to that actual soup. So they'll be served on the side of that soup. So let's look at, the, look at the garnishes that are in the soup. So those are part of the actual ingredients of the soup. Uh, so they enhance the flavor and the appearance. But so this would be the vegetables, the pasta, the meat pieces or the herbs, the things which actually make up that soup. This is generally for soups that are more hearty, um, where you may have a chicken noodle soup. There's not just a few pieces of, uh, of, of pasta floating around in it with a, uh, with a couple of pieces of chicken. It's where you'd have a full hearty chicken, uh, chicken noodle soup with large uh, amounts of pasta in there, chicken in there, and vegetables, celery, onions, carrots in there to actually garnish up that full soup. Garnishes for thick soups. So this is where we would actually add toppings because that thick soup, say if it's a cream of potato soup, it can actually hold a garnish floating on top without it just sinking down inside. So that could be chopped parsley or chives, toasted sliced almonds, grated cheese, sieved egg yolks. So this is when we're actually cooking the eggs so that they're hard boiled and we're pushing them through the sieve so that we actually have grated pieces of the egg yolks that we can sprinkle on there. Uh, chopped um, hard cooked eggs, uh, croutons, crumbled bacon, paprika, or other, um, other spices as well. A dollop of sour cream or whipped cream on top. Toasted seeds, like pumpkin seeds. Uh, fresh herbs and dried herbs. And then spiced or herbed oil. And then crostinis of bread, actual sl uh, slices of uh, slices of bread, maybe baguette that have been uh, baked so that they crisp up. And then we have soup accompaniments. These are things we're serving on the side. So we have crackers, Melba toast, corn chips, breadsticks, cheese straws, whole grain wafers, or gougères. A gougère is a filled finger-sized uh, pastry, um, maybe filled with things like pork or chicken or beef or anything like that, mushroom. So uh, today we've covered a bunch of different things on plating and garnishing, uh, all the way through from how we plate things, what we should be looking at, uh, through to how we garnish desserts, how we're uh, garnishing soups, and everything in between. So now, if there's anything on here that you didn't understand, anything that you want more, em more emphasis on, then please let me know, talk to me about that. Uh, but so that's it for chapter 22, and this is the last chapter in ProStart 2. Um, so if you've covered all of the other chapters, uh, then you should be ready with a little revision to be able to go ahead and take your ProStart 2 exam. Good luck, and I'll see you in the exam room.